Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. You remember that, don't you? Of course you do. That's the third commandment of the ten. But then neither you or I would do that, would we? Or wouldn't we? Stay tuned for another special encore program about God. In all the hurry and hustle and confusion of modern living, the Lord has a way. We believe the Bible is a revelation of His way. We invite you to join us for In Search of the Lord's Way with Mac Lyon. My friend, it gives me great pleasure to welcome you to our program of Bible study, In Search of the Lord's Way. Remember, we're closed captioned now for the hearing impaired in your family, too. And it's all made possible by our friends, devoted Christians in churches of Christ. And that's why we don't have to use any of our valuable time haranguing you about money. Why not pay these friends a visit in a nearby congregation right soon and tell them thank you for the program. This is the last of five special encore programs this month in which we're exalting God and magnifying His name. The widespread casualness with which we treat God nowadays, even in our worshiping assemblies, may well be the primary and central cause for the deterioration of our American morality. There just has to be more cause for the shootings in our schools and businesses and churches and on the streets than just the availability of guns because we've had guns for many years. No, it isn't the implement with which the deed is done that's evil. There has to be another reason, a deeper one than that. And uh, some of this is being done by churchgoers. So just being churchgoing and religious people isn't the answer. And you know, in the Bible, the nations that held God in irreverence went down the drain. There's a reason that that first commandment of the Decalogue is, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. And the second is, thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. And the third is, thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. It must be obvious that if men in any generation or society fail to respect and honor God, the other relations won't be right either. Well, today's message is a repeat, as we've said. It's a special encore program. It has to do with respect for or the lack of it for God's Word. It's highly improbable that a society or a church or a person that has no fear of God will maintain a referential respect for His Word. If you'd like a copy of the attractive little book containing these messages, uh, you may have it free by writing us In Search of the Lord's Way, Post Office Box 371, Edmond, Oklahoma. By email at searchtv at aol.com or you may use our toll-free telephone number 1-800-321-8633. Audio cassette tapes are available too. They're free. Ken Helsbrand is going to lead us now and then we'll be back for the encore presentation about God and His Word. reading again from Hebrews chapter 12, and this time we're beginning at verse 22, and we'll read to the end of the chapter. But you are come unto Mount Zion, and unto the city of the living God, and heavenly Jerusalem, and to innumerable company of angels, 
to the general assembly and the church of the firstborn which are written in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of Abel. See that we refuse not him that speaketh, for if they escape not who refused him that spake on earth, much more shall not we escape if we turn from, away from him that speaketh from heaven, whose voice then shook the earth, but now he has promised, saying, Yet once more I shake not the earth only, but also heaven. And this word yet once more signifieth the removing of those things that are shaken, as of those things that are made, that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. Wherefore, we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved, let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear, for our God is a consuming fire. Now we will pray to God. Our Father, our great God, full of mercy and holiness, purity and love and grace, we bow before you with thanksgiving for all that you have meant to us and all that you continue to be to us. We pray, our Father, that we may enjoy your presence with us today in this study, and that if each, each of us may be strengthened in the things that matter most. We'd ask your special blessings upon those who have special needs, those who are hospitalized, those who are suffering in other ways, and those, too, who are suffering bereavement today. Attend our way. Be our constant companion. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. In order for there to be a relationship, and that word relationship, that, that's our modern word. The Bible calls it fellowship or communion between God and us, between God and his offspring, Acts 17, 28. There must be communication between the two. God must in some way communicate himself and his will to us, and we must have a way to speak our praises and our needs to him. Stated more briefly, God must speak to us, and we must speak to Him. From the very creation of man, it's been so. In the very first chapter of the Bible, verses 27 and 28, it said, So God created man in His own image, and the image of God created He him. Male and female created He them, and God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it. In the New Testament book of Hebrews, chapter 1, verse 1, the Holy Spirit says to us, God, who at sundry times and in divers manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son. Hebrews 1, 1 and 2. That's King James Version. McCord's translation has it, Long ago God spoke to the fathers by the prophets at various times and in many ways. But in these last days he has spoken to us by his Son. From those passages then, we know that from the very beginning to this present day, God has always communicated with man or spoken to man. He's done so at different times, in different, many different ways. Directly, as he did in the garden, as we just noted, in visions, as he did to Abraham in Genesis 15 and 1, in dreams as he did to Jacob in Genesis 31 and 11, in a cloud as he did to Moses in Numbers 11 and 25, in a whirlwind as he did to Job in Job 38 and 1, and by his prophets. But in these last days he has spoken unto us 
by his son. Did you get that? In times that are now past, God has spoken to men in these different ways, but in these last days, the Christian age, he speaks to us through his son. Isn't it correct to say then that according to the Bible, God no longer speaks to men directly or in visions or in dreams or in a cloud or in a whirlwind, but that he speaks to us through Jesus Christ, his son? Certainly so. If that isn't the meaning of that for Christians, I don't know what it means. In his prayer the night before his crucifixion, the next day, Jesus prayed the Father, I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. And now, Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world, meaning the apostles. Thine they were, thou gavest them to me, and they have kept thy word. Now they have known all things, that all things whatsoever thou hast given me are of thee. For I have given unto them the words which thou gavest me, and they have received them, and have known surely that I came from thee, and they have believed that thou didst send me. John 17, verses 4 through 8. So God gave his son his words, and his son taught them to his God-chosen apostles. To assure the accuracy of their recall and delivery of all that Christ had taught them and would later reveal to them, he promised them the Holy Spirit as a helper and a guide. John 14, 16 and 17, John 16, 7, 13. Therefore, their preaching and their writings constitute God's Word to all men today. The Holy Spirit caused it to be written in 2 Timothy 3, 16, 17, that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God, meaning it's God-breathed, and it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Therefore, God speaks to us today through the word of His Son, which is delegated to His apostles, and it is revealed in the Bible. So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God, Romans 10, 17. Well, what about the fellow who says, the Lord spoke to me directly and personally, or the Lord said to me in a dream last night, or the Lord sat on my hospital bed and we visited and he said to me, or some other similar claim. Yes, well, in view of biblical teaching that we've just observed, suppose you tell me what it means. In 1 Corinthians 4 and 6, we're warned against thinking of men above that which is written. Oh, someone's heard saying, but the experience of hearing God speak is an indescribably exhilarating experience, and there's no such experience as that that comes from reading the Bible. As a matter of fact, he says, reading the Bible gets to be a drag to me. Here's a person who values experience above what the Word of God says. I'm afraid such a person has been listening to the voice of another God, because that isn't what these people in the Bible would say about that. And that's the evil against which we're speaking, the almost total absence of any reverence or respect for God's Word. Let's consider for the moment the power and the authority with which God speaks. In the 33rd Psalm it said, The Word of the Lord is right, and all His works are done in truth. He loveth righteousness and judgment. The earth is full of the goodness of the Lord. By the Word of the Lord were the heavens made and all the dust of them by the breath of his mouth. He gathereth the waters of the sea together as a heap. He layeth up the depth in storehouses. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. For he spoke, and it was done. He commanded, and it stood fast. Verses 4 through 9. In the passage which we read a while ago from Hebrews 12, God is telling us that 
We in the Christian age have come to something greater than that mountain that shook and trembled and burned when he spoke from Mount Sinai. In our time, his voice shakes both heaven and earth. Well, this is an obvious reference to the prophecy of Haggai, chapter 2, verses 6 and 7, that's fulfilled in the Christian age, that God speaks even more powerfully now than he did then. He speaks by different means, but his voice is heard in heaven and in earth. These scriptures are his word. They are as powerful, even more powerful, than if he had whispered them in our ears privately. What then should be the human response to the word of such a great and good God as he, who speaks so powerfully? Here's the thrust of today's message. See then that ye refuse not him that speaketh. For if they escape not who refused him that spake on earth, much more shall not we escape if we turn away from him that speaketh in heaven. People who are casual with God will be casual or careless with his word too. Is that too much of an assumption? No, I think not. It's the only logical conclusion to which we can come. In fact, the former is the probable cause of the latter. We hear TV and radio preachers speaking so glibly about their experiences with God. God spoke to me as if it were some kind of a joke. It probably is. That isn't the way people in the Bible responded to God. For example, the Scripture says when God spoke to Adam, Adam said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. Genesis 3.10. That reminds me of the time that Jesus borrowed Simon Peter's boat to use as a pulpit, and when he had finished his sermon, he told Peter, launch out into the deep for a catch of fish. Peter told him they'd fished there all night and hadn't caught anything. Nevertheless, at Jesus' command, they did. And they caught so many fish that the boat was about to sink, and they called for another boat, and they filled it. It, too, was about to sink. And Luke 5 and 8 says, When P Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at, his knee, at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. The prophet Isaiah describes his feelings when the Lord called him to the prophetic ministry in chapter 6 of his prophecy. He said, In the year of King Uzziah's death, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, lofty and exalted, with a train of his robe filling the temple. Seraphim stood above him, each having six wings. With two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called out to the other and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory, and the foundations of the threshold trembled at the voice of him who called out while the temple was filling with smoke. Then I said, Woe is me, for I am ruined, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. And in the first chapter of Revelation, the apostle John describes the circumstances of the revelation that came to him on the Isle of Patmos. And he says, I heard behind me a loud voice, like the sound of a trumpet, saying, Write in a book what you see. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as a dead man. My friend, that's the way the great men of God behaved in the presence of the Almighty and Holy God of the Bible. They were not flippant. They were not casual about it. They loved Him. Surely they did. And with full realization of their sinful humanness, they prostrated themselves before Him in deep, deep humility and reverence and heard Him. They listened to Him. Jesus once took Peter, James, and John up on a mountain, and there he was transfigured before them. What a significant occasion. 
And you know, Peter, impetuous Peter, he wanted to do something for Jesus. And while he was talking about it, a cloud overshadowed them. And God spoke from the cloud saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. And verse 6 says, When the disciples heard it, they fell on their face and were so afraid. What a momentous and memorable occasion. And Peter wrote about it in his second, in his second epistle. And listen to what he said about it. We have not followed cunningly divine, devised fables when we made known unto you the power of the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. majesty. We receive from God the Father honor and glory when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved Son in whom I am I'm well pleased. And this voice which came from heaven we heard when we were with him in the holy mount. We have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto you do well that you take heed as unto a light that shineth in the dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation. You see, in spite of all of what Peter saw and heard, there was something even more sure. It was the Scripture. The lesson is, God speaks to us today in His Word, the Scriptures. He speaks no other way, and we must not refuse or reject it. Say, my friend, if you're not a Christian, why not become so today? Don't refuse God's Word. Receive it in obedience. Confess Jesus Christ to be the Son of God. Obey Him in baptism now. Dear Father, we thank you for your word, for the guiding light that it is to us today, for the strength and the power which we receive from studying it, meditating upon it. In his name we pray, amen. It's been our purpose in these special encore presentations again this month to instill a deeper reverence and fear of God in the hearts of all, especially professed believers. The irreverent and disrespectful manner in which many of us approach God in life and even in worship is without doubt the root cause of the breakdown of our social order. 
It isn't enough just to be religious. It, it, it's been observed that some of the youth who have taken guns to school and shot up the place were religious. It isn't enough merely to be believers in God. Depending on who we're reading, 92 to 96 percent of Americans say they believe in God, but they treat Him with less reverence and awe than they do some of the sports or music stars. It isn't enough just to attend church. When people assemble to worship God in reverence and godly fear, when people come to worship a God whose name is to them holy and reverend, when they respect God as much as they would some human dignitary, the other problems will vanish. You see, worship is not a casual event like a backyard cookout or a beach party. Reverence and fear of God will also eliminate the distracting human innovations in worship that are tearing some churches apart because the focus will then be on God, His holiness, His greatness, His goodness, His severity, and not on the new and amusing and self-focused novelties that we see. Fear of God will result in surrendering in obedience to the teachings and the will of God who is greater than all gods. It's this contemptible casualness about everything, especially about things that are holy and sacred that's simply destroying us as a people. My friend, we need to get hold of it now. Thanks for being with us today. I pray you've been blessed by our presentation of these messages. And if you'd like to have a copy of all of them in this attractive little book, titled Holy and Reverend is His Name. You may have it absolutely free. The five lessons, Holy and Reverend is His Name, Great is Our God, Worship with Reverence and Awe, The Goodness and Severity of God, and today is titled God Whose Voice Shakes Heaven and Earth, all in this little book. And you may have them on audio cassette too, a tape too if you like. They're free. Simply write us in search of the Lord's Way, Post Office Box 371, Edmond, Oklahoma, 73083. Our email address is searchtv at aol.com. You may use our toll-free telephone number, too, if you like. It's 1-800-321-8633. Just say you want the little book about God, and we'll know what you mean. We're presented here by your friends in Churches of Christ who would like so much to have you worship with them at your very first opportunity. I hope you'll do that. And uh, we plan to be back next week at this same time, and I hope you'll be with us at that time also. May God bless you and keep you because we love you.